Welcome to How the Song Came to Be, where soulful songwriters share the stories behind their songs, as well as tools and creative practices you can use to bring your best songs or other creative works to life. I'm Ann Heaton, your host. And like healthcare is like this unmovable object in the US right now. And again, I'm hopeful that it won't be forever, but because it's considered such a, I don't know, sacred thing to have options and choices, somehow there's this myth in the US that you have no options and zero choices if you have a universal health system. Welcome to How the Song Came to Be. I'm Ann Heaton, your host. I am here today with Dr. Shuvo Ghosh, who is a friend of mine from high school. He is a developmental behavioral pediatrician who works at the Meraki Health Center and Montreal Children's Hospital. He is also a songwriter and musician. Uh, his latest album is an indie pop album. So we, Shuvo and I recently reconnected on Facebook, maybe it was about a year ago, yeah. um, after I wrote uh, a post about some feelings I had in high, some suicidal feelings I had in high school. And um, he, he reached out to me and was like, I had no idea you felt this way. So we've been um, kind of talking about music and, and life, um, you know, over email and over Facebook ever since. And, you know, basically this podcast, as a lot of you know, um, has been about, you know, providing creativity tips and songwriting tips to songwriters and other makers. And originally it was, a, you know, private. It was for students uh, or for people who opted into my list. And this year I decided to, to make it public. Um, and I wanted to add a component this year because I felt like I kept getting this message, you know, when I was meditating. I, I thought 2020 is really like going to be this big shift of a year. And so I was calling it, you know, to my husband and kids, the year of illumination. I was like, this is the year where we're going to start seeing, um, you know, more of a paradigm shift and the old structures, you know, that are unsustainable will start to fall away more and more. Now, I had no idea that, um, that coronavirus was coming, but when I was thinking about the year of illumination, I was like, I really want to interview uh, Shuvo and I really want to talk about the ways that um, he might be incorporating creativity into his job as a doctor. And I really just want to expand what it means to use our creativity um, at work. And so, um, I'm so glad you're here. I know I just Thank talked you. a lot. Um, I, um, I guess I don't know where to begin. Maybe we could just start with what, what got you into songwriting? Um, you know, what was it for you that made you want to write songs and be a musician? And then maybe you could also talk about what got you into medicine. Yeah, sure. Um, so just to reiterate also, it's great to, to reconnect face to face <laughs> at, a, at a really great physical distance. But it's been a long time uh, since we've actually chatted in real time. So this is really, this is a cool feeling. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, maybe just to answer that, that question about what got me into music from the creative perspective. Um, I mean, I had been taking piano lessons since the age of five. I, you know, I was into music, but it was never my own music that I was playing, you know, when I did like classical training and something about my sort of need and desire to write generally, because I wrote poetry and short stories and, and things like that, you know, in my childhood and, and through high school as well, and even getting into college. Um, it was right around high school when I decided, you know, a, a song, you know, a pop song is really just a poem put to music, right? And so if I'm writing poetry, like I can, I can try to work out a melody to go with, this, with these poems. Uh, and that's kind of how I started shifting towards songwriting. So in fact, I would almost say a lot of the poems I was writing were, were songs, in my head oh, at least, yeah. you know, from that early stage. Um, and so that just kept kind of, I guess, um, growing, evolving, um, over the f ensuing years, you know, when I was in, uh, in college, I was writing a lot of, of music as I finished up the university years. 
um, before starting medical school uh -huh. um, and before coming to the second part of your question. Yeah, uh, so that second part of the question is, you know, about how I got into medicine. But before I really get it back into that, you know, it was that period even before starting med school um, where I, I was at home. I actually um, finished college a semester early, and that semester off that I had pretty much was, was the moment where I think my songwriting took off. Um, wow. I was at home with my piano most of the day, reading books, like just kind of studying languages because that's, that's a hobby of mine interest of mine and I did linguistics in undergrad as well so that all sort of came together and then I just was writing songs like daily um, a lot of them were like you know I look back and I think oh man those were so immature they were such terrible first attempts you know and but by honing the skill I started feeling like I was getting better and better at actually writing songs and writing lyrics and creating melodies and harmonies and different parts um, so yeah, it's just, it was from that period where it kind of matured and grew. Um, I, there was a minor detour because of med school and because yeah. of medicine. Yeah. Um, I still kept it up. I was still writing sort of whenever I had a chance and I was playing whenever I had a chance. Um, but of course, med medical school was busy. And why did I get into that? I mean, m multiple reasons. Um, both my parents uh, were physicians. Uh, my my late father was like a, a surgeon who was hardcore into medicine like yeah. that was his identity my mom is a retired pathologist it was the job she did it wasn't her identity she's also a writer she's written a couple of books of short stories and okay. had a creative side uh, so I was kind of stuck in the middle of like liking science liking medicine growing up in a medical family but not necessarily sure I wanted to be a doctor. Uh -huh. um, and it was really during undergrad, while I was kind of veering towards maybe writing, I was doing screenwriting courses, I was doing, like I said, linguistics, all this other stuff, that I, I volunteered um, at an emergency, at a pediatric emergency room one summer. Mm -hmm. And that kind of got me turned on to the idea that, I mean, I guess I could work with kids. Wow. You know, I guess I could, I could actually be a doctor for kids if I choose to do that. Um, it's interesting. It's fun. It's enriching. It was fulfilling. So I w and I was just doing registration at the emergency room. I was just like really at the front desk, you know, just kind of like totally helping the admin staff. But then I sort of had this thought, like, this is an environment where I could I could work even as a as a professional. So that's kind of what prompted me to to seriously think about med school. Uh -huh. um, and it, it did kind of an annoy me that I was being pulled towards what was a traditional profession yeah. to make a living because I knew somewhere deep down that making a living as a songwriter or as a short story writer yeah. was going to be really hard. Yeah. Um, it was going to take a lot of effort and luck um, and some tough times. Yeah. You know, and like, and even just doing my music now, um, in more recent years, it, in my non-medical times, I realize, you know, you're playing a gig in front of like a random crowd in a small place in a bar or like in a cafe and like no one's really paying attention and you got to just keep going for it and doing it yeah. to try to get like somebody to pay attention to what you're trying to say yeah. or, or what you're producing. And I know you've gone through this whole lifetime of doing this you know until yeah. you've kind of gotten more of a a base right you know it's like it's it's work it's right. actually really hard work people right. think it's like a super fun thing to do you get on stage right. it's like like the most nerve-wracking crazy feeling <laughs> right you feel like you're gonna barf every five <laughs> seconds and no one cares what you're what you're saying or doing um when you're starting out right and so i kind of realized that in the process of being like, you know, really into music yeah, and realizing like, I don't know, I'm going to just like be playing bars for like a decade right. and hoping somebody likes it enough to like want to work with me and produce some records or, or, right. you know, like, you know, release a single or two or, you know, 
sign me or you know it's like the old right. mentality what we used to have growing up in the 80s and 90s right you know like you got to get signed you know to a label or whatever right. it's different now happen. right right it's well, totally yeah, different. you don't have the linear you know you don't have a clear a clear path like another right. question you know at least if you finish medical school you know okay that's that's something i i completed yeah. that now and i kind of yeah and I, I guess i kind of felt like if i did it and then didn't want to be a doctor i had that option oh interesting oh yeah so did you feel yeah, like you kind of use that as like kind of like yeah, med medicine was my backup plan. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. You know, it was like, all right, I can get my degree. And then if I ever, and if I really want to practice, like I yeah. can, and if I, I feel like I hate it, like yeah. then I'll move along and then like, I'll, I'll start jamming out again, you know, and, yeah. and like just form a band and like do something, you know? So I, I kind of was feeling like I better get this degree yeah. and then I'll have it in my pocket at all times. And yeah. I, liked it enough i liked what i was doing enough to continue pursuing it and i also picked a specialty which you had mentioned at the beginning of developmental behavioral pediatrics where it's mostly outpatient um, we see kids with disabilities with behavioral issues um, you know certain special populations we're not really working on the weekends a whole lot uh -huh. we're not doing an overnight calls very frequently so right. that was like super amenable to being a creator because I could actually right. Friday night come home and like not be working and actually pick up a guitar uh, and yeah. play music or go practice with the band. Like it actually was working as both, um, you know, being right. a doctor so could, and they, a musician. They could nicely coexist. Yeah, exactly. In a way that maybe other medical professions would not nicely yeah. coexist. So yeah. one thing that comes to mind when you talk about how you found your way into medicine because you were working with children is that seems like that makes sense to me because you have a very playful and fun yeah. kind of personality engaging. Um, so that makes sense to me. I guess what I'm wondering is do you feel like um, – do you feel like your life as a creative person and a writer or a maker has informed, you know, how you interact with these children or in any way informs how you um, do your job as a doctor? Yeah, I do think it, it does. Um, I think it's definitely easier to connect with kids who are maybe a little bit more open and exploratory about their creative side um, by nature because it, developmentally that's what they're they're learning language they're learning to walk they're learning to you know interact um we encourage that more in kids to to draw to paint to try to play music to, to expand their possibilities and if even as an adult you're still taking part in that creative process of you know making something um all of a sudden it's it's you feel like you're on the same page as some of these kids, right? Yeah. And you're relating to, to their life, to their daily life a little bit more. So I definitely feel like it helps. Um, it's, it's also just being open to, to kids, I think, and, and just, you know, the types of questions and the way they think and see the world. Um, you don't have to necessarily be a songwriter to be able to do that or, or right. to, to, to be an artist to do that. But I think it definitely helps because it often – kind of opens up another part of life, you know, yeah. when you're not just doing one thing or one thing that doesn't necessarily need a lot of your own input and creative effort. If you kind of go through things like sort of robotically and you're, you're kind of going through a, a daily schedule that's rote yeah. and you're sort of habituated, yeah. um, you, you're maybe not connecting with what kids are needing because right. they right. don't want to just be repetitive they got to try different things. They got to experiment. They got to make new stuff. Um, and they, I think probably relate more to people who are doing some of that in their regular life as well. Right. So, so can you give me an example of what is a typical child patient that you're, what are they struggling with or what are you helping them with? So we, for me personally, I see kids with specific kinds of, um, you know, issues, I guess, you know, we, we get consults to try to evaluate, um, and assess to sort of diagnose. I sometimes hate the word diagnosis. I say identify maybe more because some of them don't have an illness. They just have a, an issue to deal with. 
Um, so it's, I would say sort of special populations. So the examples are, you know, kids with autism or a developmental disability, um, attention problems or behavioral issues or learning issues at school. Um, I see a, a fair number of kids with gender questions. Um, yeah, I saw you doing variants. a podcast about, um, you know, speaking about gender issues. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. I loved what you said. And yeah, of course, we really, remember what it was now, but yeah. yeah it's like, it's a super fascinating group of kids and, and they often get overlooked just like kids with sort of what we might call invisible disabilities, you know, who have um, anxiety um, or uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Like nobody can look at them on the street and know that they've got an issue that's that's actually affecting their functional status every day. Like they can't necessarily walk out the door feeling good about themselves because they've got something that's actually really affecting their their ability to perform, whether it's at school or with friends or even at home with their with their family. So things like a lot of these kids who have gender questions early on, like no one would guess that they've got a problem or an issue or a question at all. Right. Um, and it seems to come out of the blue, you know, and then the par even parents will say, well, this, my kid's been super normal. I'm using like quotes, you know, to say this. Um, and where could this have come from? Like how, why, why would there be such an issue? But it might've been bubbling under the surface for yeah. years. Right. And they just didn't know how to talk about it. Yeah. So it's really interesting to work with these kinds of kids because, um, kids who have, a developmental or behavioral issue because in fact we find that being creative is one of the best ways for them to actually sort of achieve their intervention goals oh. you know when you're working on on uh, physiotherapy or on certain skills or communication skills or if you're trying to help somebody who's exploring what's ha what their gender really is and you know why why they feel maybe um uncomfortable in their body yeah. um, being creative is the best way to sort of be to create an outlet for them to to express themselves right. maybe by writing a song or drawing a picture you know sometimes you don't have words that are easily translatable in a conversational way right. but in a more artsy way if you want to call it that um, it Absolutely. works you know so, so when you identify when you when a kid comes to see you and then you realize okay you have a sense of, you know, what's going on. Do you then prescribe, you know, art therapy or? Sometimes. Art yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's cool. um, art therapy, obviously speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, but, but yeah, the creative, like all the creative aspects, especially if they're in kids who are in school, if they're, uh, if they're at school age, sometimes we see kids much younger, you know, preschool kids or even infants with the developmental issue. But if they're school age, we expect that their school um, resource teachers or additional assistants who work with the, the, the educators at school will be doing that sort of stuff. And it's kind of part of our set of recommendations, you know, that they should be working on every aspect. Like if, they, if they've got really pro uh, big problems verbalizing their needs and they have yeah. expre expressive problems, for example, like right. with a with um, a language delay. Well, maybe drawing out what they need is gonna be, or using visual imagery is gonna be way easier for them than trying yeah. to learn all the words right away and continue to fall behind in, in class and school. So it, absolutely, it's part of what we, we talk about and recommend for a lot of them. Awesome, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm, we are, I, I love doing, I mean, I'm, I'm not a drawer. I'm using quotes too now, okay. um, but like I always use drawing and the songwriting workshops because I feel like it can access, you know, another, another part of your brain or it uh -huh. may end up seeing something that you, you didn't even know about yourself or even you didn't right. know you felt or you didn't know you observed. And so a lot of times on the front end for people who don't love drawing, I'll get a lot of resistance, but usually on the back end, people, there's always something that's revealed, you know? Yeah. 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 Because our culture is so like dependent on words. So if you're not really a word right. person, it can be, um, I think it can be challenging. I think we, we miss so much because we sort of like see the world as labels. Like we see things, like I'm like mug, you know, but do I really right. like, see the mug? Like, right. Right. Or do I, am I just like looking at all my labels of things? And so, yeah, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm so yeah. excited. I mean, I feel like if, if I were a little kid and I were having some troubles, I mean, I would want to run into you. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, hopefully, <laughs> that's what we're. That's what I'm trying to do. You know, I ho I'm hoping that what we do is actually helpful. And I mean, I we do have evidence, you know, from from research that some of these things really do help. But there's no way to be 100% accurate with anything in 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 life, really. But in healthcare, for sure, you you make your best estimation, right? And so we we can see that these things have a positive, a net positive effect. Are they exactly what every kid needs? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, right? And we do our best to try to, to, to gauge, you know, the needs of each family and each kid. But that's what we're trying to do, right? You know, we're trying to stay open as well. Um, I think that's really something that I've learned being in this particular field of medicine. Yes. Is that it's, it's much more observational as a first step than a lot of other specialties in medicine. So a surgeon goes in, has a diagnosis, um, finds out you know, what's going on, uh, where they need to operate, and then does their procedure. You know, that's, that's what they're supposed to do. Right. But the thing is, they might not observe a whole lot of other things in the behavior of the family, the patient, you know, friends of the patient who come to visit after the surgery. But that's our job, actually, is we're supposed to be looking at that stuff first so that we can kind of gauge, well, where is this kid headed or where is this family? Sometimes they're teenagers or older teens. I do see some young adults as well. And, you know, you, it's like, I need to know where this is going before I can sort of gauge what, where it is, is right now. You yeah. know, it's, it's kind of, it seems in yeah. reverse for, for a lot of people. It's like, well, why are you looking into the future or trying to make predictions instead of just assessing what's in front of you right this second. But we're looking at it from a different perspective, I think. And that, that's really been helpful for me in just dealing with society and dealing with people, yeah. right, as a person. Yeah. Well, I just want to underline, I mean, I noticed a few minutes ago when you went to use the word diagnose, then you changed it to, I think, identify. Yeah. And it sounds like what you're saying is that, I mean, one of the things people say about artists is, is that an artist's main job is to, like, observe and witness and, and, and take in information yep. it sounds like that's what you're doing i mean if you're yeah. i feel like with a surgeon your job is really more to like fix a specific problem and you yeah. just have to, you have to like take in a lot more mm -hmm. and um yeah i mean yeah. i'm so relieved to know that like medicine and creativity are, are overlapping in this way that you would that you that you're allowed to recommend art therapy and, yeah and yeah other, yeah yeah and that you're Absolutely. working at the schools and yeah yeah yeah. Great. So um, I also want to ask you about COVID-19. Yeah, for sure. It's relevant to right now. Um, so two questions. So maybe you can just kind of take these in order. Just like I think a lot of people right now want practical um, tips from mm -hmm. a doctor, which you are. And I know that um, uh, you may be having to uh, work with COVID patients who you don't know yet. You know, yeah. So, um, you know, I've been talking to my brother who's a doctor at Mass General in Boston, and he had given a few tips. I'm wondering, you know, he was recommending things like maybe have conversations with your family now, if, you mm -hmm. know, when people are not sick to say like, what, what would you want? Or, you know, mm -hmm. would you, would you want to be intubated if it came to that? Or if I somebody gets sick in our family, um, you know, how, what's our family plan for, uh, you know, are you going to stay in one room, you know, for isolating that kind of yep. thing? And yep. Yeah. I just wondered if you could speak to that, if you have any other tips. Yeah, for sure. I, and I, it's funny because, you know, growing up in the U S and then now living in Canada for about, I want to say approaching 19 years, like 18 and a half years. Um, it's really interesting to me to see the similarities, but the, but the differences in kind of the overall medical and social approach. Um, because I think there's, um, and it, part of it is just based on reality. It's based on the reality of what's actually happened over the last, say, two months with COVID-19, for example, um, that there's this mildly fatalistic view um, in the U.S., as compared to Canada, where we're, we are also talking about some of these same things, you know, what are your advanced directives 
for older family members in particular? Do you want to be resuscitated? If you got sick, like how long should your treatment last? Give us some idea. If you pass out and you're in a coma, do we do something? But we kind of have that conversation here in Canada, just across the board, like generally for older individuals. And it's recommended more and more um, that that's actually talked about more openly. But we're not really talking about it specific to COVID-19, right? We're, we're not really talking about it in those terms. What we're really focused on is kind of that second point that you made about what should you do actively right now if you or someone you know gets infected or tests positive and how do you isolate the best, you know, rather than kind of jumping to, oh my gosh, we, you are likely to end up on a vent or maybe you're going to get really sick because we know that it's still a very small percentage of people overall of the infected group mm -hmm. who will actually get severely ill. Right. But we also have this other, and this is just so crazy and it's just, I have, I have no choice but to actually bring it up because it's kind of, kind of cliche to bring it up. But because everybody here has access to healthcare universally, without question, the same healthcare, essentially, um, you know, there are small differences based on which hospital you might end up at or which doctor you get or which nurse sees you. That's just, that's just stylistic, you know, luck, flip, you know, flip a, flip a coin. you got a really sweet nurse or you got a really like harsh mean nurse or a doctor who actually cared about you or who was a little flippant, that's personality, right? But you don't get a difference in access to medications or equipment based on like how rich you are, where you live, or who you happen to know, right? right? Because it's just across the board, everyone's got that access. So people are not on a general um, sort of sense panicking yeah. that, oh my God, I might not get to the hospital in time to be treated when I have mild symptoms. I'm gonna have to sort of wait it out and get really sick before someone's gonna take me seriously and then I'm probably gonna crash and I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up dying from this anyway. Um, yeah. Or I might never get to a hospital because I have no insurance. Or I have all these other pre-existing health conditions which you know, realistically in Canada we have a much lower rate of a lot of these things like heart disease and diabetes and you know, asthma and all this stuff that is pretty high in the US. So yeah. there's all these complicating factors and I think that's a really stark difference that we see wow. in the conversation. Right up here, yeah. we're not really talking about like, oh my God, this is likely to kill you. It's more like, please don't spread it because there's people on chemo that this might kill. Right. Right. So please right. don't do that to them. And so we're talking about isolating um, how to be really hygienic, um, to distance physically properly. You know, yeah. and we were we were talking earlier before you started the the recording of the for the podcast about. Yeah how there's always a percentage of every population that just doesn't want to follow the rules or just yeah. is ignorant about it or some, or just never hears about it and really can't listen. Um, luckily, I don't think that's a high percentage here, but that's what's causing the, the problem, right? That's what's spreading this. That's and when so, they say that, that they can't listen. They just can't. They can't. It's like they have like some kind of like <laughs> short great. circuit that's in their brain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm giving I'm giving them an out I'm giving them an out <laughs> they're unwell <laughs> somehow but um but yeah so I think the key then at that point is really to be able to know how you protect not yourself but your community your family and your community like and that's what do you really suggest if you have to isolate within within one house yeah member of the family so I, I'll give you a, a personal anecdote um this Past January, um, my wife Andrea and I were coming back from visiting my mom and sister in Hawaii and with my mom in tow. She stayed with us for the month of February. And so she came back, she's 82, um, a stroke survivor, like in quite good health, but you know, with, a, with the risk factors of age and having had a stroke in the past, we really don't want to get her sick again. Um, and we, about three days after we got back, started having symptoms that we now look back on and realize probably were COVID-19. Mm. Like we didn't realize at the, at, you know, late January, 
in North America, everyone was like, ah, you know, that's, a, that's happening in China and Hong Kong. It's not really happening anywhere in North America yet. Yeah. But we had the like, classic symptoms. Um, and Andrea, who has a little bit of like reactive airways and like mild asthma, actually had a lot of breathing trouble um, for about a week. And all this to say, we used general contact precautions that we would always use in the uh, sort of presence of somebody who might be vulnerable, like my mom, mm -hmm. and she did not get sick at all. So what did we do? What we made sure to do is, if you have access to two bathrooms, not everybody does, but yeah. if you have two bathrooms, to separate out the bathrooms and just never ever vary from it. Like don't accidentally or run to one bathroom and be like, oh darn, yeah, I didn't use my designated bathroom. Just stick to your bathroom okay. if you happen to have it. If you have only one bathroom, a lot of families do, yeah. then it's just about cleaning up after the bathroom use. Um, so after the person who's quote unquote sick or test, even not sick, but just test positive, uses the bathroom, that it's sort of wiped down or Lysoled or you yeah. know yeah. bleached or whatever it might be, but yeah. disinfected properly. Yeah. The, like the the handles the sinks the the handle for the toilet you know like any like the bath bathtub faucet like those kinds of things should just be disinfected i know it's a, it's extra work yeah. it's really annoying it seems yeah. annoying especially if the person has like mild symptoms of a cold right they're like this COVID-19 is so stupid. I got a runny nose and a little cough. Right. And like now everything has to be bleached down every time I go pee, right? right? But it's kind of imperative right now because you just don't know who's going to do badly with it. Most right. people are going to do fine except for that one person and you don't know why. Maybe right. it's something genetic. Maybe it's something else that's going on. If they might be young. They might be old. It's just they don't breathe well as a result right. of it. So right. that's really key. The other right. thing is about eating, like food time, like you know, dinner time, supper time, breakfast, whatever it is, not to share utensils or cups. You know, um, I I personally hate this as a as a very whole person health oriented doctor with like a nutritional bent as well in my practice. I hate saying like microwave your food because I don't don't really like microwaving right. um, if you can help it. Right. But during this critical period, if you have a microwave at home, yeah, use it, yeah. like actually use it like it, and separate your, the plate that, you know, the rest of the family is going to use and the person who's positive is using, um, microwave their food or their plates and their, the, you know, the, whatever they're going to eat, whatever you're heating up, because it actually is maybe a, a way of killing the, yeah. the, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, like right. it will actually get nuked, like absolutely yeah. like killed by microwaves. Right. And so, I mean, use it for now. I yeah. mean, that's, it's better than getting it. Um, and, you know, another thing that we just realized here, we've been talking about at the Montreal Children's, which is a big problem for a lot of hospitals, is that it can actually pass in your stool even if you're just having like a, a normal bowel movement and like, yeah. and you feel otherwise fine, you're not having diarrhea, you're not having upset stomach, none of that, but yeah. you go to the bathroom, you have a bowel movement and you flush. And when you flush, you get a little bit of the virus stuck in the water particles that whoosh up with the flush. Oh so we've realized that that has just been found like in the last less than a week in the last five to six days people have realized that that's a one way that the virus gets into the you know into the air that you can breathe it in or it can get on your in your nose or something yeah. so or even your eyes so actually what's recommended is if you've got a toilet cover yeah like to close the toilet cover and then flush yeah okay I mean, it's just another one little extra step to prevent it from like getting into your bath bathroom and you know settling on your, on the sink or something without you realizing it. And the problem with the hospitals is we don't have toilet covers on our seats uh -oh. at the hospital. Right. So what's recommended no is problem. like shut the door, flush. Do not like open the door and you know right. flush you know as you're walking out because Let's then you might get it out in the hallway and stuff. Right. You know. Oh man, that is it's, so tough. It's so it's like little things like that which we don't think about, right? Well, right. And so like let me go. Okay, so we've got um 
separate plates, nuke your food, which you normally wouldn't recommend. Can we put uh, dishes of a sick person and a healthy person in the, in the dishwasher together? Is that yeah. fun? Yeah. Okay. But what I would say is you might want to rinse, like do a, like a rinse off mm -hmm. of their, their plate, like kind of a full rinse off before yeah. going into the dishwasher. And if you've got a cycle that's got like extra hot, you know, extra heat. Uh -huh. um, if you know somebody's got symptoms, like a runny nose and stuff or a cough, just use that like sanit sanitary setting on your, on your right. dishwasher. And if you have separate bathrooms, use them without variation. If you yep. don't have a separate bathroom, which I already know a bunch of people, you know, I can think yep. of people come to mind, don't um, really lie solid down. Yep. Um, I was like going with this assumption. I wanted to keep buying from my local bakery, like their bread. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to like freeze it. And right. just in case, if anyone, it'll, and then, and then I found out like freezing does nothing, <laughs> you know? So now I bring the bread home yeah. and I, I nuke it. Yeah, and I mean the thing is, like, freezing won't keep the virus out, but it'll keep your bread good. You know, it'll keep your bread. It'll like you can like toast it after you know for it straight out of the freezer, and like that's what we've been doing. That's a good way to stock up on bread. Right. By, if you have the means to try to, I mean, like, look, that's that's the other thing that's that's happening right now as a result right. of this. And like the side, the sort of side note to what we've been talking about is the fact that uh, my wife and I also own a cafe, and. So that's taken a hit right now, right? right? Like it's, it's, right. Um, it's a not-for-profit. It's, it's a basically set up to support a not-for-profit for our clinic. But oh, we wow. had to sort of like put things on hold at this cafe because, you know, you don't want to risk like people coming in, hanging out, spreading it. Like now there's directives to, to not have these places open. But even right. take, take out food is not something we want to do there right now. But the places that are open which is like, this is their only livelihood. It's like restaurants, bakeries that are still open for take takeout stuff. Yeah. If you want to support them, like buy some of the stuff, freeze it, you know, and like at least you've still given them something to like work with, you know, because a lot of these poor businesses are like at the brink of like not reopening ever again if this lasts a couple months. Right. No, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So support your local businesses, buy stuff you can freeze and then cook. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I love that. And I just wanted to circle back to a couple things you said when you said it seems like overkill to maybe be being so careful if someone doesn't have symptoms, mm -hmm. but that in a particular person, it could hit them really hard. I think that's yeah. why just getting back to my brother for a second who works with only COVID patients, I think what he was seeing was that somebody like perfectly healthy on a Monday, 10 days later, you yeah. know, just unbelievably accelerated and that the difference now is not I think many of these people have advanced directives but normally your family members would be with you in the hospital and you'd have yeah. a patient but now they can't come in so these decisions are being made over the phone yeah and so that doesn't yeah. feel you know the, you know you just don't get to have the the real face-to-face -face moments and that that and just you know having that thought I know it's super morbid in advance so that you're but it's, but it is important. No, it's super important too. And, and I think, I, I guess what colors my view a little bit on that is working in pediatrics, you only tend to see those discussions start happening for chronically or terminally ill kids, right? Yeah. And we haven't really had, and COVID-19 is an example uh, yet again of, a, of an infectious disease that has a very low childhood mortality rate. Uh, there are still some kids and especially already vulnerable kids like i said kids on chemo you know that that that's a whole different story that's uh that's another sort of segment to deal with but yeah. typically developing kids with healthy immune systems are not usually typically dying from this at least not so far let's keep it that way let's hope yeah. that stays that way okay. yeah. but I think when you start working in adult medicine, for sure, now all of a sudden you start seeing the possibility that someone otherwise healthy crashes from this. Right. Um, and there's m multiple factors. You know, maybe it's just they're not aware of their own symptoms or they've got some other responsibility or their stressors are really high or they have really bad immune issues that they've never realized they had. Yeah. You know, they've got like terrible skin, bad allergies, 
eczema all the time or something like that. And they don't realize that, Hey, this is maybe because my immune system doesn't work really well. Yeah. Um, and, and they've never even gone to a doctor. So yeah, you can just clean the blink of an eye suddenly go from a little bit of a cough to, I can't breathe at all anymore. Yeah. Right. And then, then it's all dependent on where you end up, who you're with, what's your access to care. So I absolutely think it's true that we should have these conversations. It's just, it's funny, like as a society, we're having less of them here in Canada, I think, yeah. than in the US, but yeah. it's really important to still have them right. because, because of the isolation. Like there are people who are waving goodbye through like a window to oh. their loved ones. Oh God. That's heartbreaking. Yeah, that's right, right. It feels like we're like living in like the dark ages or something. You I know, know, where, I know. How yeah. is this happening? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so I, w I also want to circle back to something that I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but when you were talking about how you have universal health care in mm -hmm. um, Canada and how we do not have that here yet, yes. yeah. that's me being very hopeful with the yeah. yeah. So in... I, maybe, you know, I don't know if we talked about this. I used, I was a, uh, a White House intern that worked on healthcare reform in like 1994 mm -hmm. um, under Ira Magaziner, who was working for Hillary Clinton. And it was such an, I mean, this is why I did not go into politics. It was such a frustrating oh my God. thing to be a young person coming out yep. of our high school. We went to St. Ignatius in Chicago and, you know, feeling super idealistic and like wanting to like- totally you know, make the world a better place. And reading that bill, that healthcare bill, I read it from, you know, cover to cover or whatever. And then seeing the resistance about the bill oh being not true. Like I yeah. remember seeing people picketing and saying like, I can't choose my doctor. I won't, you know, all these like, basically like lies. And so yeah. Yeah. as a young person, you know, I think my parents thought like, oh, she's gonna get a job and, you know, work at the what and I was just like so disillusioned I was like I don't understand I don't understand what's going on and now to be here in 2020 and mm -hmm. it's still something that we don't have um, it's crazy it's it's really frustrating and I and I've seen it too and I know this is a podcast about songwriting sometimes yeah, you, yeah. Know, you know but I just like even seeing some of the conversations we're having now about it where you know there were um like in some of the democratic debates, they were talking about how um, they were like the restaurant union is upset because if we have mm -hmm. universal coverage, they're going to lose the insurance they fought for. And you're like, well, no, actually, if we have universal coverage, everyone's going to have health care. But even right. the people who know that on the debate stage are using it as a talking point. Yeah. And you're like, oh, gosh, can we get on the same team here? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, it's funny because I volunteered and worked on the Clinton campaign, both Clinton campaigns in 92 and 96. And I remember specifically that state of the union address where Bill Clinton came out holding this like improvised card saying like, this will be your U S health healthcare card, you know, that everyone will have just like your social security number. You'll have a social security card and you'll have this healthcare card. Um, and, you know, it was called Hillary Care, you know, before it became Obamacare and now then whatever, Bernie Care or whatever hell else it, they decide to call it next, you know. But I was so shocked that it was just blown so out of proportion. Like we have, like everybody gets a driver's license, you know, like people literally get national other kinds of services and like healthcare is like this unmovable object in the u.s right now and again i'm hopeful that it won't be forever but because it's considered such a i don't know sacred thing to have options and choices somehow there's this myth in the u.s that you have no options and zero choices if you have a universal health system which doesn't make sense. I mean, it's just, it's just about access. It's just so that everybody does actually get access and no one's really like just soaking in profit from it. Does that, does that mean nobody makes any money in healthcare in Canada or the UK or in any other country in, in Scandinavia, Norway and Sweden? Like nobody makes any, like all doctors are just like, you know, homeless nurses, you know, like are begging at food, at, you know, at soup kitchens to get fed so they can go see their patients. It's like, that's not what happens, right? Like 
if people are still making a salary or, or you know, money in whatever economy that we've got in healthcare, because it's a constant need. It's just like back in the old little house on the prairie days, you know, like Doc showed up and he was never in want of food or shelter because everyone knew they needed him. Like healthcare workers are essential as this COVID-19 pandemic is showing. They're just as essential to society as people who are taking care of sanitation and garbage and, and cleaning. And they're proving themselves really essential right now too. And what actually gets forgotten, and I want to bring this back to the topic of your podcast, is that in this time of sort of a serious crisis, when we're talking about health, first of all, not having access to reliable means of healthcare is just criminal. And secondly, we're totally forgetting what makes a society tick and, and functional and worth saving, right? Like, okay, so we got to save everybody and we got to provide them health care so they get better. To do what? To go back to their jobs and be, you know, robotic slaves in some office. No, that's not what your culture is, right? Your culture is about the songs you write, the art you create, the stories you tell, the, you know, the, the, the tales that, and the, the poetry you share down from generation to generation. Like, that's your culture. If you're not saving that, well, who cares about healthcare? Like, forget the healthcare. Like, we should all just, like, you know, wrap it up and say, oh, it was a nice run. Right. End us here because there's nothing worth saving. So we have like, to actually why, why be Why do we want to be healthy? It. We want to be healthy to truly live. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, I like, we're that. not having enough of that conversation at the same time. And I think my sort of dual identity as a songwriter and a physician is really like allowing me to see this stark contrast. Everyone's like, Oh my God, here they're, they're talking about the guardian angels who are our healthcare workers. And I don't hear anybody saying like, well, what are you doing during all those hours of self isolation? Are you watching Netflix? Are you listening to, you know, your Spotify, you know, track listing? Are you listening to songs from your high school days? Are you, you know, are you playing music yourself? You know, now finally for the first time in a decade, you got, you pulled your guitar or your violin out. I mean, that's what we should be talking about, right? Like that's what we're living for. Yeah. And we're not living for going back to the office. Yeah. When all this is over. Right. Oh, I can't wait to get back in those meetings to go talk about, you know, um, what type, what, how big the paper should be, you know, in our front office, you know, secretary's yeah. desk, like who the hell cares about that stuff, right? right? So we need to be able to kind of stay alive, um, <laughs> keep our spirits alive, yeah, um, and kind of maybe find a way to, to continue to correlate these two things, yeah. um, you know, cultural life with organic, physical, personal life. Um, you know, the, bod the whole body of our culture staying healthy is dependent on our, the, the soul of our culture staying healthy. Totally. Like expanding the idea of health. Like I just, it's, yeah. I love Absolutely. it. I love what you're saying. It's, yeah, it's, it's resonating so deeply. I'm starting to take notes because I, I want to like say like six things at once. Mm -hmm. um, that's beautiful. And I hope everyone will take that to heart. I mean, I think that is happening. People are playing more guitar at home. They are, mm -hmm. they're connecting more. And I do feel like there will be changes in our society that are great. I mean, like yeah. maybe, I don't know, 30, 40% of people will realize they can work from home. And so, you know, the expressway in LA, you know, there doesn't need to be as yeah. much pollution. I mean, right. this is like all, this is like an experiment we never could have done. You know, what else could get planes out of the sky? You know, yeah, and like, yeah, absolutely. Just be like, well, so what happens to climate change when people stop moving? We couldn't just do this experiment, but we're doing it because of these circumstances. And I'm hoping that there will be many per permanent changes uh, because of this. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While I'm also holding, you know, my concern for people on the front lines. Um, but I wanted to get back to choice really quick and we'll, we'll wrap it yeah. up soon. Sure. 
But when you were talking about people wanting to have choices, one of, one of the things I've noticed about being, you know, we've been home for two and a half weeks. I think I've left the house like twice mm-hmm. to get the groceries. And today we went to a, like a, a state park, but um, we're mostly home. And I have to say like having less choices, <laughs> one of the most liberating things that's ever happened to me. Like, I don't have to be like, should I go here? Should we, do we need to make this meeting? Do we need to make this event? Like with all the things that the kids have going on, there are just less choices. And I am, I am so much happier with yeah. less choice. And I just think there's like, you know, there's something about modern life where the choices are just, they're infinite, you know, and we have infinite choices at every moment of the day in time. We can watch any show we want. We can, you know what I mean? And it's just like, there's something about that that's exhausting because you're yeah. making like millions of micro decisions, <laughs> you know, all day it's long. So and true. Like this simplification is, you know, so yeah, I we're I, talking about that in terms of, yeah, the doctor, no, no, but, but, but I think, important. no, but I think that's really true. I, I want to follow up on that because we like um, my wife, Andrea and I talk about it all the time because we've been actively very consciously trying to stop feeding into this and, or, or letting ourselves fall into this trap that more choice is automatically better. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be, there's a, you reach a certain threshold, you know, she grew up in Romania under communism in, in that sort of old Soviet style communism where there was one thing, one party, one leader, one set of books for all schools, one television channel, you know, everything was just one thing only. And so that's oppressive, right? Like when you feel like, okay, there's no freedom, there's no liberty whatsoever. People equate that with sort of socialism or communism or progressive thinking like, oh, well, you're going to end up as the Soviet Union or you're going to end up as Romania. But the reality is there's, that's not, that's not the definition anyway. I mean, that's another discussion for another time. But even under those circumstances, that's where you kind of realize, okay, well, I need to have more choices, but I don't need infinite choices, right? Yeah. Even if I had two choices, oh, wow, that would be so much better than one, right? And then you start getting addicted to the idea of, okay, two, well, four is better than two, eight is better than four, you start exponentially growing. Well, now we've got a thousand TV channels. Is that really better than the, whatever the 10 that we had back in the early 80s? that we used to watch, not necessarily. The quality of some of those channels is, is horrendous, right? Like there's not quality anymore. So you reach a threshold and there's a certain level of options you do need. And this applies to healthcare as well. Like, you know, if you have a terrible, terrible physician, you wanna have the option of finding a different physician who actually will listen to you and, and actually understands your problems or it helps diagnose you. You want a second opinion, you need to have the option to have that opinion. Yeah. But you don't need to be able to be seen by 5,000 physicians because none of them is going to be able to then know you, follow you, or get to figure out what you really need. Right. It's, that's not the way you should ha- sort of set things up. And this right. applies to anything in life, right? It really, really applies to anything in life. If you can buy 5,000 kinds of apples, you're going to be paralyzed in the grocery store trying to figure out like, well, which apple, like what's the criteria today? Is it, these are five cents cheaper. So do I want to save the money? But those look nicer and they fresher. And like, yeah. you know, these are bigger and yeah. you know, these are from local places and these are from far away. You know, it's like how, you're, you're completely overwhelmed and yeah. people have super bad anxiety, panic yeah. attacks, stress. That's just like subclinical, you know, yeah. like they're, they're yeah. feeling like, like nervous all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't know why they're like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm having a nervous feeling day. I mean, yeah. I'm an anxious person, I guess, but a lot of it is not because the individual is that anxious. It's because society has created this environment for them to be super anxious all the time. You know, that's funny. You mentioned that. So I have this weird, like, I don't know if it's a tick. I don't know what you call it. Um, but I pick my hair with my mm-hmm. left hand. Like, yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's sort um, of a habit or it could be a tick, a mild minor tick. Or something. I don't, yeah, I don't know yeah. the definition, but it's like something I, I, I couldn't stop doing. And I, I was hypnotized for it twice and it would help me for a while, but it would always come back. 
But as soon as the coronavirus came and I was at home, it stopped. <laughs> yeah, I mean, see, and it's <laughs> I was like, is that like, because like, like I'm like not stress in related. the crazy pace of the world or something? Right, right. Like it's <laughs> external to you, right? Like, you, well, that tells you something about like it being somewhat external to you, like how your body's reacting to that external environment. And like when you're not in that environment all the time, like a lot of these things will stop. <laughs> will fall away, yeah. When I, yeah, isn't it crazy? Maybe the pace of the world will, won't go back to what it was. Maybe we can we find can a, a happy medium. I hope so. Um, let me ask you one last thing. I, I'm sure. not exactly sure how to phrase this. Sometimes the way that I ask questions is um, by example, but like I, this morning I was working on a, a custom song for someone and I was, you know, I worked on it for a long time, you know, but it felt very regenerative, you know, like I didn't, lose any energy from how much time I, I spent on it you know it was mm -hmm. sort of, um and then later in the day I went out and I felt kind of really stressed and um sort of then exhausted you know like I kind of crashed mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering like you know is there do you have any tips or can you talk about how I'm assuming you do this how you maybe try to bring a calmer or more creative regenerative energy to a situation like that is a crisis mode that normally would put our nervous system into overdrive mm -hmm. is there a way to kind of navigate that so you can kind of blend the energy system so you're not crashing and burning as much because i feel like a lot of people who have stressful jobs right now uh, right now and on the front lines experience that and then e even people at home are experiencing that yeah yeah and, and a lot of people whose jobs might not have been that stressful or, or less stressful are now at home in really stressful situations because they're usually not at home with all their family members or their kids all day long every day, right? And they're isolating in a situation they're not that familiar with, right? And it's, you know, and maybe there are certain aspects of that that are regenerative or super uh, empowering, you know, like the, 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 the quality time that you get with family or, or your kids or, um, some friends who, you know, some people live with roommates and they're like, wow, I, I never spent like a five hour period talking to this roommate and getting to know them that well. And like, this is amazing right now. Yeah. However, it does drain you too, right? Because it's, okay. a, it's a novel experience. Now, songwriting isn't new to you, right? It's not a novel experience. And like, it's, I think it's probably more that feeling of that background stress that's, that's there that, maybe what you're what, you know you and others and myself probably too even you know in the sense of when you're creating something you're suddenly feeling this other sense set of energy um but if your background stress is high internally because it's not necessarily that much that your external environment is you know causing you to pick at your hair right now right like we just said right. it's just there's there's this thought process happening in your head, knowing what's happening in the world outside, the greater world outside, not even just outside your window, but like an ocean away, there's people dying in Italy, you yeah. know, and that for some sensitive people, people who've got a fair amount of empathy, who are um, maybe uh, intuitive by nature, it's particularly hard and most creators are quite intuitive or you, they wouldn't be creating, right? Like people who are making songs, right. writing songs or performing them have to have some level of intuitive skills. Otherwise, or then they're just not, you know, really great artists or they're not really able to enjoy what they're doing. So that same thing that brings positive energy to our lives is bringing in a certain level of negative energy right now because we're so aware of all these other people going through a hard time suffering and we actually care enough to think about that right but without totally. consciously thinking about it we're unconsciously going through this constantly maybe even while we're sleeping maybe while we're dreaming right so i think maybe the answer to that that question is finding some way to to be and it sounds very, again, cliche to talk about mindfulness. It's not so much about mindfulness per se, but to be mindful, to be aware. Maybe it's awareness, be or wakefulness, maybe you want to call it, about our lives. Just to be really aware of the areas, the thoughts, or the, even the actions, small actions that are actually draining you, mm -hmm. you know, while 
you might be in the middle of something else that's empowering you, you know, like writing this song. Mm -hmm. And like you might not get the benefit that you otherwise would have had from an experience like that if you haven't been aware that through that whole time you were losing energy somewhere else, you know, oh, your head was working somewhere else. Yeah, it's just so, it's just so true. I mean, this is right up my alley. I mean, this is like, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that I've been teaching a lot of kids online during this time, like a little bit more than I usually would. Um, and mm -hmm. while I'm doing that, it's like, there's no virus. But when I'm done, I collapse. I don't collapse right. from the teaching of the kids because it's totally fun and it's not really tiring. But, but I think it's because underneath, I'm pushing down the, the feelings and the thoughts I'm having about what's happening in the world. And then right. they finally get to come up when the class is over. And I'm like, whoa, you know. Yeah, it's and so, overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, even, you know, um, my husband and I have a meditation practice. We meditate every morning. And sometimes even when I feel like, wow, that was not really that enjoyable to meditate, but it was like just being present to whatever thoughts and feelings are coming up, just doing that. Like you talk about the mindfulness mm -hmm. uh, because it's running either way. You know, you can either right. observe it as it comes up and out maybe, or it's just running and you're pushing it. You know, it's there either way. And, right. Um, yeah. You know, so. one, one little trick, well, it's not really a trick. One, one perspective I have on that, um, that, um, Andrea and I tend to try to use more and more. And I think particularly because we are in healthcare and we're feeling antsy right now about the uncertainty of what was, yeah. is going to happen with, with this pandemic. Uh, we're already seeing some negative things, but we don't know if it's going to stay that way, get better or get worse and how long it's going to last. And what we're trying to do and what we've tried to do for in other situations is to really like decouple this thinking process and this mind mm -hmm. that we've got from the actual experiences that, that are true selves. And I'm sort of saying that like semi facetiously, whatever that true self is, I don't really know. There's yeah. many ways of describing it, but yeah. that is like the authentic real experience. Yeah. Our mind is interpreting the experience and right. that's what's draining the rest of us. That's draining our organic body. Our cells just can't make that much energy. Like we're just tired out, right? right. And if we're just like stick, sticking to the authentic stuff, then whether things are going well, poorly, terrible, they're sad, they're, you know, they're going to make us frustrated or angry. Those are all the thoughts that we've got. Right. That's not what's actually happening. Whatever is happening is we're in this little corner of the Milky Way spinning at like, you know, half the speed of light and floating in, you know, in a random direction away from the center of the, the universe, right. you know, for the next 10 and a half billion years. Like yeah. that's what's really happening. And like, right. we're not really like thinking about that. We're like thinking about all these other things and interpreting our experience right. on this planet and stressing ourselves out. So I love that idea. The we can kind of decouple it a little bit and say like, well, yeah. It's not, you don't even have to observe it. You just have to know that there, there are these two aspects of what we're experiencing. One's like the real thing, and one is whatever our, our mind is telling us is the real thing. Totally. Right? Totally. And if you can kind of work on that, like if you can get your mind to say, yep, my, yeah, mind, yeah, me, that's what I'm doing. Um, okay, I'm going to let that keep running, but my body can't just let – all the energy get be used by that. I, I, my body needs to be authentic for a while, you yeah. know? And then all of a sudden you're, that's, that's like literally like background noise. Yeah. And it doesn't drain you as much if it's right. just purely background noise. If you're listening to background noise all day, your brain's going to be fried, right? Yeah. Like you just can't keep going. You can't focus anymore. Like you feel like everything is static and, yeah. It's, it's really unhealthy, right? So that's the thing that's happening right now. I think in a global scale, everyone's like seeing stuff that's not happening just to them. It's happening to all these other people and people who are sensitive, that really affects them, right? Yeah, I, I, it reminds me of um, the practice of just feeling this, feeling sensations in your body, you know, like when you just stop mm -hmm. and you just notice like, oh, there's a little, you know, and then you're, you kind of leave your mind uh, not literally, but for that yeah, process. Yeah. And um, that can be, you know, just even noticing like 
what does it feel like to be like I'm sitting on a piano bench right now what does it feel like to be on this bench like yep. a little uncomfortable but like while I was you know engaged I wasn't even aware of that so right um what do you do sorry one last thing yeah 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 what do you do so like you know I I've had this meditation practice for since 2006 or something and I you know I do yoga and all these other, but how do you if you're walking into an emergency room mm-hmm. you can kind of feel your adrenaline going are there techniques that you use in that situation mm. to try to get your body to to calm yeah down? yeah I mean you know what I it's, it sounds funny but what it, I guess it's a way of tricking myself because I because those moments are pretty stressful you know, no doubt about it, right? Like they, they are in like in every way, right? Where you feel stress for yourself, you feel stress for the people around you, you, you might feel stress for with some patients who are coming to see you. There's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability. Like that unknown is probably the most stressful thing for any human, at least, probably for any living creature. If you don't know what's, what's coming, if you can predict it, you're not going to be so stressed if it's unpredictable yeah. your body's like on high alert and you, you never know what's yeah. going to happen so you, i i often will try to trick myself in those situations a little bit i know it's a, a technique to trick myself but if i can kind of do it without letting my adrenaline go way high i will have stopped myself from from suffering a lot of negative consequences and what i try to do at that point is really to consciously say i whatever's going to happen Ultimately, like my life is one of billions on this planet. Right. Right. And it will end one day. Yeah. You know, and I won't be here anymore. And like no one's going to know and care. And it won't really matter, even though it matters in that moment. Yeah. It won't matter on a cosmic level. Yeah. Like whether I did the right dose of medication or the wrong dose of medication for this patient. So yeah. if uh, so that's kind of tricking myself, right? In a way, because right. I'm minimizing the importance of something that might be really important, but I'm kind of trying to put it in perspective and say, right. like, I can't, I can't get that worked up. If I let myself get so worked up about this, I will have missed the boat on what existence is all about. Right. Like I just, I, I, I gotta keep it in perspective. Like I'm going to do my best. And then we'll see, we'll see what the next steps are. And I have to constantly like say that almost as a mantra to myself. Like I'm just one little speck in a speck amongst specks. And like that's, you know, it's like Carl Sagan idea of like, you know, we're all just like floating on this pale blue dot somewhere in this corner, forgotten corner (laughs) of, of, of the universe. And like, we can't think of ourselves as any bigger than that. Right. And if we allow ourselves to think that way, all of a sudden, everything kind of feels okay. Yeah, It feels totally. so much calmer. Because then even the things that you think are important aren't so important. And things that are not important are just as important as the things that you think are important. That's the, the flip side of this. Mm. Something that's super trivial to you is just as important as something that is super important to you. They're equal. Interesting. And so all of a sudden you can kind of calm yourself down a little bit and say like, yeah, well, like just whether, where I put my glass this morning was probably about as important as whatever I say to this patient next. Yeah. Just kind of neutral, neutral yeah. everything. I can even it neutralizes that. the fear, right? Yeah. The fear part of it just gets yeah. taken out of the equation. I love that. Then you I, can mean, think. I feel like giving yourself that huge perspective shift is I mean, people can get so paralyzed over decisions. You know, you're like, you want to make the right one. And, and you want to feel like there was a sign that the, <laughs> the, yeah, universe feels, yeah. the universe is behind you in this decision. And I think that's just because as humans, like we're such meaning makers and making meaning can we be are. beautiful and we can make art out of it. But it, it has this other side when we're, we're interpreting everything and we're, you know, micro managing our decision. Yeah. Well, but that's it's kind of like, you know what? It doesn't really matter. Like yeah. the decision or that one. And then you'll just keep right. living, you know? And, and the thing is, I think we've given ourselves um, this false impression that we can make sense of all the things that have meaning because if nothing has meaning, everything has meaning, right? That's, that's what I mean about that flip side. It's like it, literally everything is meaningful, but we can't say we're so 
great at interpreting this that we can figure out the meaning of every little thing because that's just the way the universe works like every little thing is happening it's not that it's not happening for some right? reason this is reminding me i don't know if this is going to make sense to you but this is yeah. reminding me of when uh Thich Nhat Han was interviewed by like oprah winfrey and i think she was like what is this like for you and uh, he said in his very nice, like neutral way that it was, it was just kind of like every other moment, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And, and he, he meant it like, yeah. you know, like this was yeah, yeah. not like a special occasion. I mean, he, he understands the cultural construct that it's supposed to be a special occasion, but for him. Yeah. It was just like any other month, day. It was just, it was like any other day. Cause he's not like caught up in that. <laughs> right. <laughs> that reminds me. I want to get yeah. to that state. Yeah. I don't know. Well, that's kind of the goal. That's kind of the goal in a way, right? To be able to live in that way because people think that trivializes things. It doesn't. It actually makes everything really meaningful. Right, because you're not going around going, this is important, but this is not important. Right, exactly. Everybody, everything has, once something is important, then something else has to be not important. You're great. Correct. You know, and yeah. Yeah, <laughs> if you get away from the hierarchy of it, all of a sudden, like all the little things, you can take the pleasure out of the little things too. Like we don't, yeah. you probably don't sit there thinking like, oh, it feels so great to adjust my glasses. It's like, oh, my glasses, like, wow, this is so, this is so fun. Like, who does that? Like, you know, when I'm wearing glasses, like, I don't do that. Right. But if you can get to a, a mental state, I guess that's the end goal, you know, for this existence of humanity, uh, this, this era of humans and this level of brain power that we've got. Maybe that's our goal is to be able to take all the pleasure of life out of every little thing, not just the negative stuff and the fear out of really difficult situations. There might be pleasure in those situations as well. And yeah. if, that, if we take pleasure out of just adjusting our glasses or you know, like combing our hair, yeah. like those fearful moments aren't gonna be so fearful. Right, we, our life gets better if we start, yeah. if we start noticing that. Um, yeah, anyway, it's like we've kind of gone on a tangent, but like it's, this is kind of how- But I feel like we're how, getting closer to the point. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of how you gotta try to train your brain a little bit and again, I'm saying brain, I'm not even really meaning brain. I think it's whatever that authentic self is, wherever it resides, partly in our brain, partly in the rest of our cells, partly outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, that authenticity is what we're seeking, right? And I think that's what allows people who create art, um, people who deal with others, other creatures, doesn't always have to be humans. There are veterinarians who deal with animals. There are people who, botanists who deal with plants, other life. Um, that's the connection that we can kind of start making and seeing is that, you know, there's an authenticity to everything, every living being. Yeah. Um, it's inside us too. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. This is super fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It's fun it's, talking after 30 years. I know. It's ridiculous that it's been that long. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, it took a podcast to make it happen, but like, uh, yeah, we well, gotta, we gotta make sure that we, we find time to do this at, you know, intermittent um, for sure. What do you, so just for my own amusement and maybe yours, what do you, what do you remember about me from high school? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to ask probably the same question. You're going to like, you need a flip flip side of like, I remember the braces. Uh, I, okay, well, one thing I remember is your hair. Um, like uh, the hairspray, that was like the 80s thing. Like I remember yeah. your hair like so vividly, like coming into school and seeing the Ann Heaton, Beth Hamilton hair look in homeroom. That was so real. Oh um, I don't even remember that. But yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> just go back to the yearbook at some point and look at your, yeah. your photos. <laughs> um, I mean, that was just like a visual impression. You know, a lot of people are visual. Um, and I think I am to some yeah. extent. I'm auditory and visual, but I, I remember that imagery. But I just, I think it was such an interesting time that um, at St. Ignatius for, for our cohort, like I, our class, I mean, I, I just have all really fond memories. I actually enjoyed high school as much as it can, as high school can be enjoyed yeah. um, because it's a tough period of time being an adolescent yeah. um, for anybody. Yeah. And I think, you know, you had mentioned at the, the top of this, how you had posted on Facebook 
about your your thoughts, your feelings, your sort of depressive moment, you know, with the with the sort of suicidal thoughts. And and I think a lot of us had them. Yeah. A lot of us like acted almost on the edge of like doing it, you know, and like I mean, I don't know if that was just true of our class or a few or the class ahead of us and the class behind, you know, be just below us, if it was something about that time frame or just where we lived and what we were exposed to, or if that's kind of universal, yeah. it's hard for me to guess. Yeah. yeah. But I felt like there was a, there was a hidden dark side. Yeah. But a, a thoughtful dark side to a lot of people in our class. Um, yeah, that's interesting. And, and I felt like I didn't know how to express it. And I kind of, I would see it and I would witness it. And like, I, I sort of felt like this, like, I don't know, it was like this weird, like invisible connection that I would make. And this is, and it's relevant to, to, you know, your question about what I remember about you. It's like, I felt this weird, invisible, like connection to this, who's this chick named Anne, you know, like, you know, like people would ask, probably would have asked me like, what, what, you know, why do you, why do you have any positive thoughts about her? Like how often do you even talk to her? You know, like, I don't know. It wasn't about talking. Yeah. It was like certain kind of people with a certain vibe. I just kind of, felt something connected to them yeah and you were one of them yeah honestly you really were and like yeah. you know and maybe it wasn't always mutual because we were all kind of playing our roles and we had our like sort of our masks on you know like kind of trying to be something in our family and something in society and something in yeah. our classrooms and yeah. to our teachers and you know like we had to play all these different like little mini roles and sometimes yeah. it was hard to really get to the real real us yeah but that was kind of that's what i always remember and like i have this like, incredible fondness of just having had that opportunity to because we were always in homeroom together because it was always alphabetical yeah. having lockers not too far away yeah, you know gauche gauche and hamilton and, and hamilton and heaton and yeah. you know patty gilroy that's was, was there yeah, you know like all these yeah, like we were all kind of like kind of stuck together you know yeah. um and it was very interesting like just to have that opportunity to get that exposure and like kind of connect with certain people without having to really say anything you know yeah, which is, I, mean, I think I felt like easy to connect again always, 30 years later I feel like you were always really friendly like and I just loved that about you and you were like always up for talking and you were super smart and you were you were like energy forward you know like it wasn't like you weren't going to talk to me or whatever yeah, <laughs> I don't know yeah. like you were just like like I felt like if we talked to each other we were both like all yeah. in that, that's, that, how that's I always remember. kind of been my personality I think yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm happy that I was able to be that way because there were periods of my life earlier and a little bit later too, where short periods where I wasn't really able to, to be that way. You know, I was, I yeah. was kind of down in the dumps and, you know, kind of pretty depressed sometimes. Yeah. And so, you know, that was not like at my peak, but I think in high school, I, I was pretty much able to be myself, you know, yeah. for, for the most part. Again, yeah. with those masks and roles that we were playing, but personality yeah, it was hard. is hard. Like it was, I felt like as a sort of a shy, introverted. I mean, now I understand myself a lot better than I did. That I mean, even to just show up at school, <laughs> dress. I mean, I yeah. felt like you had to have like a certain level of toughness because there was yeah. some, definitely a toughness. Like people, like you know, talking bad about you. To, you know, there was a yeah. toughness in those halls, and I don't know if that's for every high school or if that was just our like Chicago. Catholic, so you kind of had to like put your armor on. I felt like yeah. I had to like be extroverted. I had to like be loud. I mean, part of me is loud, but like, you know, like. Yeah, but I you had to, to be like, more than you were comfortable with. Yeah, way more just to yeah. like feel safe, which, you know, anyway, it's high school. Who knows? But um, I just, I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> now no, that no. we've talked for like. <laughs> an hour and a half the longest yeah. podcast I've ever recorded um <laughs> I should I should probably wrap it up and we can for keep sure. chatting off uh, but thank you so much for coming and you know sharing your thoughts and I think absolutely it's really cool how we kind of got um you say as you say off on a tangent but I think we kind of got to the center of something so mm -hmm. um so until next time yeah thanks Anne it was great talking to you good talking to you thanks so much for joining us if you know someone who would enjoy or benefit from this podcast, please share it with them. Thanks so much. Much love.